I feel like I should begin this program with a disclaimer, but I'm not exactly sure what the disclaimer should say, so maybe I'll wait until the end of the show to uh, do the disclaimer, but it is time for the public square, and we've got the team around the table, and Wayne Shepard, probably bow out now, but Dave Zanotti is here, <laughs> Rob Walgate is here, Melanie Elsie, Jeff Sanders, and Alice C. Duncan. Okay, Dave, it's all yours. Yes, the, the title of today's broadcast is Hardy Har Har, um, and the uh, purpose <laughs> of having that? this... Okay, yeah, is the purpose of having this conversation is um, the fact that the Bible teaches us that we are to be joyful always. Now, that doesn't mean we're to be silly yeah. or stupid or yeah. crass or um, a lot of things. But if it doesn't, well, let's just put it to you this way. I was talking to Dennis Parker the other day, and you all remember Dennis did such a beautiful mm-hmm. job. Uh, at Christmas yeah. in America this year. And we did 1928. And we talked about the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous, which was one of the big stories of 1928. And Dennis had the courage to do what he does everywhere around the country is to not just perform beautifully and wonderfully, but to share his testimony, which is that he's an alcoholic and to share his story. And if you've not heard Dennis Parker's story, it's a magnificent story. Hmm. And we've had uh, a number of beautiful conversations since that time. In fact, While we were recording, he actually left me a voicemail because we've got a conversation going on right now. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking and he was, um, I was asking him for more advice as to how we could help people who are asking us for more and more information about his story, about Alcoholics Anonymous, et cetera, and about addictions. And he said, well, one of the things I tell people that are are coming into an understanding of their need for help and, and starting in with AA is I tell them to look for the happy people hmm. in their group. Look for the happy people in that community. He said, because there's a lot of people who by the grace of God are, are no longer uh, drinking. They are what, what are called dry drunks, but they're not the happy people. He said, in my experience, the people who are the happiest around any addiction recovery uh, situation are the people who have found Jesus. Hmm. They'll, he said, if you want to really know what it means to be free. Follow the happy people because they're following Jesus. And I thought, wow. So the joy that we have isn't a cavalier joy. It's not a nonsensical joy. It's not a, a banal or, or shallow joy. The joy we have enables us to laugh. In fact, another one of the authors of our American Mission Center Library, one of our anchor, seven anchor authors, G.K. Chesterton, wrote a magnificent book called Orthodoxy, one of the best books and the briefest books he ever wrote, one of the most popular books he ever wrote. And in the last pages of that book, he talked about Jesus' secret weapon. And he, and he couldn't help it. As he studied the life of Christ, he couldn't help but to say that he seemed to believe that Jesus had a secret weapon, and that weapon was his mirth, M-I-R-T-H. What he was really saying was that Jesus had an eternal sense of humor that was lying just under the surface, if you could see it. Well, good humor, great joy in his presence is the fullness of joy at his right hand is pleasure forever. So I believe God is a very joyful God, and I think humor is really good medicine. And so um, we pay attention to humor as a part of pop culture, as a part of American culture, as a part of the history of culture. Just think, all right, can anybody name one great humorist? That, that, that is a legend in American history. Mark Twain. Will Rogers. Bingo. You got them both right at the start. Mark Twain, Will Rogers, right? Mm-hmm. I, I would add Bill Murray, but, uh, you know, you could, you could go on from there. Um, <laughs> there must be something wrong with me. I thought of the Three Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> that, that works. That's because, yeah, that's because yeah. you wanted to win. I said Why name are you one, looking at you us when you say that, Melanie? <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. So, what we wanted to talk about is the role of humor in political campaigns, particularly in the American experience. And to do that, you've got to start in the modern era. If you're going anywhere from 1970 forward, you have to think about Saturday Night Live because Saturday Night Live is the bellwether of all comic opportunities as it relates to political campaigns. And something happened recently on Saturday Night Live that surprised the living daylights out of everybody. 
Uh, and I thought maybe it would make sense to play a little of it and then talk about it uh, from the political perspective as it relates to this campaign. Without endorsing one person or another, mm -hmm. let's just reflect upon this as how we're all experiencing this election. Okay, our next question comes from someone who describes herself as a concerned South Carolina voter. Yes, hello. <laughs> My question is, why won't you debate Nikki Haley? The woman who was in charge of security on January 6th. It's Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> For the 100th time, that is not Nancy Pelosi. It is Nikki Haley. Are you doing okay, Donald? You might need a mental competency test. You know what I did? I took the test and I aced it, okay? Perfect score. They said I'm 100% mental. And, you know, I'm competent because I'm a man. That's why a woman should never run our economy. Women are terrible with money. In fact, a woman I know recently asked me for $83.3 million. <laughs> and you've spent $50 million in your own legal fees. Do you need to borrow some money? Oh, Nikki, don't do this, Nikki. <laughs> Nikki Tiki Tavi. <laughs> Nikki, don't lose that number. Nikki Haley, Joel Osment. Nikki Haley, Joel Osment, we call her. Six cents, remember that one? I see dead people. <laughs> yeah, that's what voters will say if they see you and Joe on the ballot. Oh, that, yeah, that's not very nice, Nikki. It's not nice. And I'm always very nice to you, except when I'm implying you weren't born in this country. <laughs> Even though you're from South Carolina, and now I'm going to beat you in your state. And did you win your home state in the last election? I won Staten Island. <laughs> and the parts of Long Island where the fist fights happen, where they, where they get out of the cars if you honk at them. I love my world star whites. <laughs> All right, well, that is a new one on me. Okay, we have time for one more question, and it's actually for Ambassador Haley. Hi, yes. um, I was just curious, what would you say was the main cause of the Civil War? Um, and do you think it starts with an S and ends with a lavery? <laughs> Yep, I probably should have said that the first time. And live from New York, it's Saturday night. All right, so secret wish a part of every politician. Do you think there's a politician alive that doesn't wish they got the opportunity to say live from New York, it's Saturday night? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's somebody somewhere. <laughs> well, that's why it makes me wonder why she was the chosen person to do that. You know, because there's probably a lot of people vying for that. And she was the one. Like, is she like an approved opposition candidate or something? I, I, I'm just, it's campaign season. And I'm sorry. It's just the cynical nature of how I feel right now. But we also don't know who else was invited because we think the candidates would want to do it. But can you imagine behind closed doors, the, I'll say discussions, but what I mean is arguments that would have taken place probably with the Haley team before she did it, and if others were invited, because you know there's some that say, you have to do this, you have to do this, but there's others that are saying, no, you can't do this. That's a high wire act, and you're not ready for it. I didn't find her particularly funny, but that's that's just me. So I, I, don't, I, I think <laughs> you have to be careful when you're putting yourself in that s situation. Yeah. Let's talk about the context of Saturday Night Live. I don't know the last time as you've flown into LaGuardia to go to New York City. <laughs> last time I did, I was once again reminded that when you get off the airplane at the airport, you are immediately surrounded by televisions and television advertising everywhere. Hmm. You get into a cab and it's not, what's playing live video screens of actual television shows happening right now in New York City. You go downtown and everywhere you turn, New York is the television center of the world. And if you're heading in the direction of 30 Rock, which was a building that was built in 1928, one of the only buildings built during the Great Depression, uh, from the Radio Corporation of America, the headquarters of NBC, NBC News, MSNBC, all of those entities, and Saturday Night Live, owned by Comcast Universal, which is headquartered in Philadelphia. If you're there at 30 Rock, you are at the epicenter of what's supposed to be funny in America. And what's funny in America is usually what's considered to be legitimate and valuable. So Lauren Michaels, who's been the producer of Saturday Night Live for the entirety of that lengthy, lengthy run, which is a lifetime now, uh, except for a brief five-year period, uh, I think it was five years, 
um, for uh, Lorne Michaels is basically the king of comedy at 30 Rock. And what happens in regards to who gets on that show, as far as politicians go, is a very carefully orchestrated moment. Hmm. It's not open casting. It's not auditioning. It is by selection. And Nikki Haley got chosen to do that piece. Now, it does cause you to ask, why? Why was she chosen? And why would she do it? And what was she hoping to accomplish? Clearly, she made a lot of people laugh. But is there more to this than that? Well, we'll find out, won't we, when we come back here on The Public Square. We will be right back for more on The Public Square. My wife and I were recently sitting around a campfire with friends discussing the issues of the day. Everyone involved in the conversation were parents of grade school children. One dad asked, should we be worried about raising children in today's world? Now that's a question that has been asked for hundreds of years. It was asked during the American Revolution. It was asked during the Holocaust. It was asked during the Civil Rights Movement. And it is still asked today. Asking that question plays into the fear of the moment. As parents, it is our responsibility to raise the leaders of the next generation. The work of the Public Square and the American Policy Roundtable is providing resources to help parents educate the next generation. From Christmas in America to the American Mission Series to YouTube policy briefings, our goal is to provide true truth that can be passed on to others and impact the nation. The work we do would not be possible without the support of listeners such as you. Would you consider a gift today to help educate the next generation of leaders? Every day, 535 people are charged with representing all of us in Washington, D.C. They preside over the largest budget in the world. They hold the Constitution in their hands. They can help protect our liberties or look the other way. 535 people. We put them in office. Isn't it time that we hold them in our prayers? A public service message from the American Policy Roundtable. Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. Back with you in the public square, thepublicsquare.com. You all know that website. But Dave, you're asking why would Nikki Haley go on SNL? I didn't see the segment except as it was replayed on YouTube. I think she was chosen because she has a way of getting under the skin of her opposing candidate. And I think there are people right now who are saying, why would the public square waste any time talking yeah. about that piece of blank, 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 blank right. Saturday Night Live program? Well, sure. it's not because they need any more advertising or because no. we're captured in their aura. It's because Saturday Night Live isn't necessarily watched by all that many people anymore. It's not like it's the most dominant television program. It's on too, most of us are in bed. That's Except right. when Nate Bargatze was on it. That was, okay. uh, that was oh, a different story. Oh, and story. then you Christians come out. I see. Oh, I see even, how Even works. then I watch okay. it on YouTube. I was in bed. I was, I was okay. fast asleep. I see how this works. Yeah. The, the reason that Saturday Night Live, in its political humor in particular, is so important is because that's the program that all the television crews, all the elite boards, all the C-suite execs, all the people who are at the top of the top of the media world, that's what they watch. They watch what Lorne Michaels is doing and what he and his team are writing and what is being said because they still believe that that program has an outsized influence on the American political process. Now, you know, there's a lane in American politics. Uh, I would call it, name it after the late John McCain. It's the McCain lane. Hmm. It's a lane where people uh, take up the occupation of the renegade. And for years, John McCain, Republican senator from Arizona, played the renegade. He was an outlier inside his own party, and he became famous as the renegade. 
And as the renegade, he got all kinds of major media exposure his whole career because he was a contrarian and he was a Republican. And so he told the people at 30 Rock and across the NBC networks and ABC and everybody else what they wanted to hear because those entities are without a doubt dramatically left wing. And McCain was someone who was not necessarily on their side, but close enough, he got all kinds of exposure. And it looks like Nikki Haley might be deciding that that's the lane she wants to play. Hmm. You notice from her comments that she took on both Biden and Trump, made them both one and the same, and basically made an argument from the position of ageism, that they're both just too old to be president of the United States. She didn't say vote for me. She just made her comment. Yeah. And as she did that, the interesting thing to me was, you know, we know what primary is coming up, South Carolina, her home state. But where was she? She was at 30 Rock. She was in New York City. And whose home territory would that be considered? <laughs> who, who, where was she? What ground was she on that she was welcome where he doesn't really have a welcome? Again, that's not to endorse anybody or bash anybody. It's to try and define a little bit of reality. And I think that was the shot as well that she was trying to take is I'm welcome in this town. Are you? Yeah, well, no, that's a that's a really good point. That's the first person I've heard say that, Rob. That's a really good point. The, well, the other thing, Dave, from a script writing perspective, the, the, they had the fictional Donald Trump. The argument that the fictional Donald Trump made was that a woman shouldn't be in charge of the budget or something to that effect. So they're, they're laying out the case from a script writing perspective that the only reason one wouldn't support her is because you're against a woman in politics. So that was just kind of an, another like not so subtle um, piece of the argument. Oh, listen, uh, Rob, you brought up the point, and uh, Alan, thank you, you that, that, that uh, whoever's advising her, Alan, I think that the people that are advising Haley know exactly what they're doing. And I'll, I'm sure that she had to approve that script. Oh, so, I would I imagine. Mean, I, 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 I mean, yeah, I just, you wouldn't put words in her mouth um, and, unless it's S, starts with an S and ends with, I don't know, with, with whatever that was, ends with Avery or whatever. Huh. <laughs> yeah. They were giving her the opportunity. Yeah, they were giving her an opportunity to walk that back. Giving her the opportunity her to amend her mm -hmm. biggest mistake on the campaign trail to date. They gave her a free pass. Now, unless someone, and this is, we've got people listening really closely right now. They're going to wait to see if we're about to say something about a, a slight of the scale to Trump or Haley or anyone else. You're not going to catch us doing that on the public square. We're not doing that. We're not reporting this story because it is designed to influence this campaign in any way, shape, or form or tilt the scale toward one candidate or the other. We just don't do that. Yes, we have our opinions. And yes, we keep them to ourselves because we don't tell people who to vote for. But what we do comment on is what the media is trying to do to the electorate. And this was a classic case of Lorne Michaels and the gang at 30 Rock weighing in with a great big statement. Now, let's talk about the McCain lane or the renegade lane. You know, there came a time when John McCain became the nominee of the Republican Party for the presidency. And it was interesting. He didn't get Lorne Michaels endorsement. No. He didn't get the endorsement of anybody up at Comcast or Universal or NBC. When he came out to run as a Republican, they let loose with everything on him that they possibly could. So if he was doing any banking of, of, of what he thought was goodwill for all those years, not a chance. And let's not forget that NBC made a boatload of money off of another person running for president who happened to have a number one show on NBC for years called The Apprentice. Clearly, they don't have any love loss between them in regards to someone that was making them a lot of money on the air as a television star for a long period of time. And I also think it's interesting that when John McCain was the focus, that they they uh, made a lot of uh, hay with Sarah Palin. 
And she was a woman. She was running for vice presidency. Excellent point, and, Melanie. And yet they excoriated her all the time. They were ruthless to her. Ruthless. Now, she gave them a lot of bullets, you know, that, that, uh, to use. But they were, they were relentless. They were relentless. Mm -hmm. So we did a, a broadcast a number of weeks ago talking about how to stay sane in this 2024 election, that we would try to continue to um, update that as we were going through the process. Um, based on history, it's not a coincidence that what happened on Saturday Night Live happened. And if anything, what NBC 30 Rock and Lauren Michaels were doing was throwing um, fuel into the Haley campaign. And here's what I mean by that. A candidate that doesn't look like they can win, and in fact, isn't winning, she hasn't won any primaries yet, and she's not projected to win any going forward at this stage in the game. Why would they stay in the race? Like, why did John Kasich stay in the race against Donald Trump the whole way to the Republican National Convention in 2016, then tick the whole world off by, by making an anti-Trump speech as the host governor of the convention? Uh, I suspect one reason is because they have a wealthy backer or backers who are telling them to stay in the race and not to bail out until they say it's okay. They're not going to do anything unless their backers tell them to do it. That's probably the beginning of it, and there are other reasons. And it seems to me that the major media sources like NBC Comcast would love to have Nikki Haley stay in the race so that every time they report a Donald Trump accomplishment in winning another primary, they can say, and Nikki Haley, who's opposing Trump, got the following. In other words, they can continue to create the narrative that this election is being contended. And by making Nikki, Famy, Nikki Haley famous, they reduce her need to raise more money because they're making her famous. They're making her name known. And they're saying that she's a really cool kid. She's on Saturday Night Live. And if I'm a consultant to Nikki Haley, I'm saying, you better take that gig. It's the biggest multi-million dollar gift was ever handed to us. And aren't they making more rent of revenue? NBC, CBS, uh, you know, ABC, by continuing to keep this story alive and keeping Bingo. people interested in it, yep. you get more viewers, and so you gain more revenue. More, the more people who are hooked on the story, oh, I wonder what's going to happen with Nikki Haley next, you get more revenue coming in. Is that correct? And more advertising revenue. And more advertising revenue. So this is, uh, and so that people don't go nuts, you have to keep exposing what's really going on here, the games that are really being played. And so by making Nikki Haley famous, by giving her the McCain lane, by giving her the Maverick lane, what they're able to do now is to encourage her, help her, and help her stay in the race because now she's an even bigger celebrity. Well, and they also took time to uh, bash Tim Scott during the skit as well. Oh, that's right. I mean, they made it a point to go after him mm -hmm. and they went after him pretty hard. And that's someone that people have talked about possibly being the future of the Republican Party. Well, they're both from South Carolina as well. Oh, yeah. I, I just don't see how this would help somebody if they were actually trying to um, win over a conservative base. You know, to me, it, it seems like she's, she may want to call it maverick, but it seems to a lot of people like more establishment. Uh, so I, I don't know how that helps her. I, I think it's more not of her trying not to go after the conservative base, but to go after the independents. Ah, gotcha. And so then you say, well, wait a second, you know, that in some primaries that helps. They might come in and change the primary numbers. So I could guess there'd be a strategy. But what if there's one other piece to the puzzle? What if what NBC Comcast is really hoping is that by continuing to, to use the words that a Hearst used years ago when he wanted to promote someone, he would say, puff them. Mm. So by continuing to, to puff Haley and elevate her presence and her profile, maybe what will happen with those independents and other people is they would really grow to wish that Nikki Haley would be on the ballot. And then when she doesn't make it onto the ballot, those people just stay home. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's more than one way to win an election without looking like you're really trying, right? <laughs> yeah. And this is one of those moments where you may not know what happens for months and months from now. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, in spite of all that, was there the least bit of anything funny in that? <laughs> I did come up with the disclaimer that I talked about. It took, took me the whole program 
took me the whole program. The preceding program is not to be construed as a political or television program endorsement. Thanks for listening to The Public Square. Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable. Ever feel like your voice just doesn't get heard? Politics isn't just for the important people who you see on TV or hear on the news. Politics is for everyone. Don't get discouraged. You're not alone. For almost 30 years, the Roundtable has been helping people get informed and make a difference. The first step is to get the facts. The Roundtable Monthly Update is a great place to start. This important update can be sent to your home every month, helping you know what's going on behind the scenes and how you can leverage your impact. Thousands are reading the Roundtable Update every month. Why not join them? To get your first copy of the Roundtable Update, log on today to aproundtable.org.